We need better equipment. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So, um, so the men. Uh, I think you were telling me about your men's weekend experience. Yes. What, so, what was it so powerful about it that you? Because you've you've stayed you've stayed a. It's it's been a big part of your life. Yeah. It was for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Over twenty years. Yeah. So. Yeah, I did my weekend in 96 and I stopped volunteering in 2010. No, 2012. 2011, 2012. So, yeah, some, from 96 till approximately 2011, I was, uh, I volunteered for the Sterling Men's and Women's Weekends. And the, the, what used to be known as the Sterling Men's Division and the Family Women's. What's the difference between um, like the Sterling Men's Weekend and a uh, how is it? Uh, is it a religion? I mean, is, huh. is it? No, it's not a religion. It's a philosophy that I my opinion is based in common sense. And a set of values that are intrinsically male that allow the participant, I think, to transcend their, well, for lack of a better word of saying it, that to transcend their own bullshit and get to the truth of what we're really here to do. Uh, the, the philosophy is to... Uh, be the man you've always wanted to be. Well, you're always being the man you've always wanted to be. The question is, is that is that man worthy of being that? In other words, we're always all being the persons that we're being. We're all giving our best. It's just sometimes our best is really bad. But it's always, I don't ever question whether or not somebody's trying or giving their best. I think people are doing the best they can. The important thing for me now at this stage of my life is that men once again realize the value of having other men in their life because it doesn't make life easier. It just makes it simpler. And you don't have that isolation, which is a very dangerous place for a man to be alone, listening to the girls and coming up with wild stories about, you know, whatever individuals do when they're just isolated and alone. It's not a it's not a healthy place for anybody to be alone. So that's so that men alone without a purpose. Let me say it that way. Alone without a purpose. So in other words, you know, Buddhist monks go and sit and and uh, practice their discipline or you know, say a Tibetan monk goes and sits on top of the hill for 25 years to get to the source. And that's where the purpose, his intention is to be there to clear the vessel, to eliminate ego, to become empty so that he becomes full. There's a very, it's a very intentional and purposeful act that he's doing. It's not just like, I'm going to just go sit on a hill and see what happens. They're there with the reason, with the purpose. It's when people are alone with no purpose that they become dangerous or alone with a purpose that's not meant to benefit anybody other than themselves. So getting around other men is uh, essential or, or a huge boost towards... Uh, well, it's getting this, around the, other men and getting around the right men. Uh, and this gets them towards being a man yeah. that's worthy of of being it's somebody cliche, you always right? wanted to you be. Know, you, if you're hanging out with successful men, the chances are that you'll you'll have a better shot at being a successful man, whatever that means, right? So how do you define success? I think the best definition that I that I have for success is that you're living a a productive life, that you're contributing to more than just yourself. It's not that contributing to yourself alone is not successful if that's all you ever wanted to do. But I think the vast majority of people always want to help other people. They're not just in it for themselves. 
Yeah, I've, I've had interesting like debates about this, like, like being selfless is actually or like being selfless is a, actually a good idea, and almost like you can almost if you are in it for yourself, the best way to be in it for yourself is to go help others. Even so, I don't know. That's like a it's a stupid little yes, philosophical and thing. There's a whole lot of people that are only in it for themselves in big organizations that. For uh, what's the word? Profess to be about something other than they're not. But my point is this: it's very obvious to everyone what the person's up to, and it's that denial or that pretending mechanism that we've culturally kind of desensitized ourselves to. That we just pretend like, oh, he's, you know, she's not, he's not, they're not really doing what it looks like they're doing. So we, we deny our senses again. Like, I'm seeing them do this, but that's not really what's happening. You know, say uh, you go to a church, and the church starts out small. And the next thing you know, you know, the church gets bigger, and the only one that's life is expanding is the minister. You know, he's got, now he started out maybe in a two-bedroom house, and blah, 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 and driving one car between him and his wife. And next thing you know, he's got a fleet of limousines and a mansion and an airplane. What was he up to the whole time? He was only about himself. Where and if he were about, if he were about more than himself, you would see it in the improved in the, lives of the in other, the community. The yeah. So that is my argument to what is the organization producing? You know, the benefit to the men in that come to the weekend is that we, the hope is that when they leave the weekend, they take what they got and they go and improve not only their life, but the people's lives that they're in. And that's, you know, their children, their wife, their jobs, their communities, if they're church members, their church, that they participate in a way differently than they were before they came to the weekend because of these four pillars. Now I'm thinking you you were flipping to talking a little bit about your weekend there, yeah. but maybe maybe it would have just as you you say it equally about the Sterling Men's Weekend that when you got there yes. you got the sense that like this is an organization that's like part of I imagine part of the reason you volunteered there was that you got the sense that this is an organization that cares about the men that are involved in it and uh, it's making lives better for the people or that was your goal getting. I had in. a personal uh, let's say this epiphany at the weekend. And my personal epiphany was that my pur purpose was to end divorce in two parent families within my lifetime. That became the purpose in my life. I remember that. I remember you you sharing that purpose. And I still believe in that purpose. Mm -hmm. I still believe in trying to help married people that have children realize the value of the commitment of the marriage and what that means to the children. Now, that is not to say in situations where anyone's being abused, men, women, or children, that the appropriate steps and actions shouldn't be taking. I'm not saying that. So there is a catch-all. And the catch-all is if someone is being injured, then steps need to be taken to stop the injury from happening. So in other words, in a marriage that has children, where I'm saying – there's no option for divorce. There is a caveat that if the wife is beating the shit out of the husband and hurting the children, she needs to be restrained from being around the husband and the children. Absolutely. And she needs to be uh, charged and she needs to be prosecuted and she needs to su suffer whatever penalties come along with that kind of behavior the same way that men do. You know, it's ridiculous to for people to say, well, you know, you're a cult. Uh, you know, you're just about like women have to stay no matter what. No, if she's being injured, she's being physically violently hurt. The same as if she's physically or violently hurting someone else. No, they need to be removed from the presence of children. And by the way, just so we're clear. And, and be very factual about this one point that I'm going to make that's going to be very not popular to say. Children of divorce that are left with the mother do worse than children of divorce that are raised by the father. 
That's a fact. The statistics back it up. Life backs it up. Children's experience back it up. But nobody wants to say that. Why do you think it is? Why do you think because that is? the herd mentality of our society, there's a lot of identification and uh, attention that is given to this title of single mother. Yeah. And but you don't really hear a lot about single fathers that are raising children because the mother is not attentive to her responsibilities to the children any longer because maybe the mother woke up one morning and decided that she hadn't had enough sexual experiences and wanted to go out into the world and have a bunch of his sexual experiences and leave her children and just go off. But you don't hear men talking about that, but it happens a lot. The same way that it happens to women that men cheat on women, women cheat on men. I don't know what the statistics are on who cheats on who or who cheats more. I think the whole premise of cheating on a spouse is not good in the first place. I think it says that you have a very low character, that you can't honor your commitment, that you can't take responsibility for yourself, that you don't want to discipline your instinct of lust or however you want to guise it. Yeah. And that you're not willing to sacrifice those things for the benefit of the children. I mean, you mentioned the kind of a little bit about that when you were talking about the four pillars and it, it reminded me of this. I remember seeing some guy as a, I don't know if he was a guest on Joe Rogan or something like that. His name was Dan Blenzerin or Blenzerin. And he goes on these yachts and brings like 50 women yes. and fucks them all or whatever. Yes. And it was like, and, and I know that some men would consider that success, but it seemed like I liked how basically this, we would consider it based on what you're saying, like just yeah, simply but, like, but some like men, abdication listen, of like, listen, listen, not even trying listen, to rein in I understand, instance. you know, to a certain uh, select group, and I think it's a very minimal group yeah. of men yeah. would say, oh, he's successful. Not the vast majority. And this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is that that's when men need to speak up. Yeah. That's when good men need to speak up and say, you know what? No, that's not successful. That's self-indulgent. That's childish. That's irresponsible. And it's, and it's fucking disrespectful. It's disrespectful to themselves and to the women that they're doing this with. It's disrespectful as a society. It shouldn't be tolerated. That's not to say that teenagers going on a romp, uh, you know, but when you're talking about self and but it's a very small group of men that do that. Usually uber wealthy men. We're not talking about like every guy, you know, can get 50 women to go on a yacht. That what are they going to rent the yacht for the weekend? No, we're talking about a very select, small group of men who are uber wealthy, maybe one percent or less, probably less, who have a lot of money and they're very self indulgent. Yeah, I guess it's interesting because. But all men get lambasted with that's how men are. That's not true. Yeah. The vast majority of men are not that way. Doesn't mean that they don't wouldn't feel that way. Like I feel like that would be a good idea, but I know, especially at my age, what a ridiculous proposition that is. And that, you know, to me, not even to me, it, it's just like, it's such a childish thing to do on both people's part, on the women's part and the men, it's a very childish, immature way of being under the guise of what we're having a good time. Really? You devalue, you devalue yourself, you devalue another person, and you call that like, see, here's, here's one of the things that I think is important for men who are fathers, especially fathers to daughters, is that are you really having those important conversations with your daughter? The ones about her dignity, the ones about her intrinsic value, the ones about her self-respect, her self-esteem, her value to herself, how, you know, it used to be uh, taught and it was understood and, and it was actually celebrated the virtue of a woman. Yeah. It was things that were held up in the community. Now it's mocked. Women that are abstaining from having sex until they're married, they're mocked. The same as men. Men are mocked for it. Instead of like, wow, isn't that cool? 
that they have such a value, they put such a value on intimacy with another person. And maybe, and this could be just as applicable to gay couples. It's not just a heterosexual thing, not given the, where we're at today in our society, right? It, you, can't, you, couldn't, you can't no longer exclude lesbian and gay men and say that they don't have those same feelings about their bodies and about the intrinsic value of their bodies and about the sacredness. We used to hold intimacy and sex as a sacred act between a man and a woman. I will now say a sacred act between people. Men and women, or men and men, or men or women and women, I think that that it only benefits us to restore that value as a society and say no. You know, there's a lot to be said for maturing and learning about your body, and learning about your vows, and learning about your spirit, and treating yourself with dignity, and holding yourself in high regard, and not just giving yourself to the first available person that wants to rub crotches with you. But we don't talk about these things because they're important. And we try and pretend that they're not important anymore. And what I'm saying is that, no, they're more important now than ever. But nobody's having that conversation. We just want to talk about rights and how I have the right to do whatever I want. It's my body. I can do whatever I want. That's true. It is your body and you can do whatever you want. And I hope, and I, I'll say it this way, and I pray that you make good choices with that. As I encourage my daughter to do. See, I have an open dialogue with my daughter. And I, I hope to treat her in such a way that what she understands and learns from me as her father, as the first man in her life, is that I, I put a, a high value on her virtue. For her, not me. For her, because I know that's an important thing for a woman to have is her virtue and the dignity of her body. And, you know, just think about it. If we were, if we were teaching young men and women about the virtue and this, the virtue, the virtuousness of, and the sanctity of their body, you don't think that we couldn't overcome teenage pregnancy? Really? Really? As opposed to teaching them sex education? Like really, what's more important, learning how to put on a condom or learning about the dignity of your body? So maybe is, is the, do you think the weekends sort of fill in a place where like religion left off? Because I feel like these are, these used to be like religious people maybe have Listen. some sense of this and like, yes. but, but, but now religion is less popular than ever before. Well, I, and I uh, don't, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that's and, true. And, and, and schools, I think that schools religion, can't teach religion listen, listen, because. Let me say it this way. In a family, having a spiritual, uh, having a spiritual religious foundation for that family only benefits the children. Now, of course, we're going to talk about the extremes and the cults and the whack jobs that you know think that they're the reincarnation of you know John Dellis or whoever the hell that is, and you know, but those are all fringe ex extreme examples. It's like. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of Catholics are not pedophiles. Right. The vast majority of Catholic priests are not pedophiles. The Catholic Church did a horrible job not talking about this, not making it an important conversation, and trying to not talk about Sweeping it. it made rug. it worse. Yep. When if they would have just came out in the beginning, and you know, and really, you know, pedophilia. Uh, violence against women violence against men violence against children it's much deeper than just to see the sex is juicy to talk about that gets everybody's attention but you know it was way you know way before that there was plenty of really crazy shit going on where adults were treating children badly abusing them but they were the priests they were the nuns they knew better they had the direct channel to God. You totally invalidate your own responsibility in that. Well, it's okay for the for the you know children to be being abused by the nun. It's okay for the priest to do it. It's like it's not okay for anybody to violate a child's body, the sanctity. This is what I was just talking about. 
the sanctity of a person's physical body that what are we telling children? So in other words, with corporal punishment, what are we telling a child when an adult can take their hand, myself, yeah. a six foot two, 210 pound grown man, and I can strike my child under the guise of disciplining them. Well, how hard? Like, how do I know the exact amount of pressure so that I don't injure my child? Because if you've allowed yourself to get to the point where you're so angry, you think you need to be physically abusive with the child, the child's not the one with the problem. You are. You've become a child. You've become a child.